welcome back to yet another episode of the Ryan C Show. I am, of course, your host, Ryan C, and you are, of course, listening on the Built in Buffalo Network. How are you guys doing? Um, so first, I, wanted, I, I do want to give a shout out uh, to two different things. One of them is a personal plug, but also one that is a plug for Built in Buffalo. Let me just bring it up here. While I'm doing that, I do want to give a shout out really quick to some non-Buffalo based hockey information. Um, the Seattle Kraken, the newest franchise in the National Hockey League, has won their first game. They are one and one on the season as of the recording of this podcast or, or this episode. So congratulations, Seattle. Um, that said, uh, Built in Buffalo recently partnered with LDG Sports and Entertainment, and uh, you guys have not been showing the love, uh, and which is very surprising of both fans of Buffalo, people of Buffalo, and especially Built in Buffalo. Um, so maybe we just haven't been marketing that good to you. Uh, so I'm going to do it right here really quick with a quick rundown. We just hit a massive episode drop. So remember, we're an official partner, the only official partner, uh, as of right now, built in Buffalo. Massive episode drop uh, has occurred this past week. We are in full speed ahead mode at LDG and built in Buffalo. So let me get to it. If you like sports betting, you're thinking of getting into sports betting. Cody Couch, who is a personal friend of mine, um, he knows what he's talking about. You can get your NFL uh, betting lines on your week by week episode of Big Bet Ballers. Again, that is Big Bet Ballers. Week six just posted. Um, go ahead and give that a listen before submitting your bets heading into this NFL week. Uh, following up with that, the Rust Belt Report just had two recent episodes. Uh, that is a show that's hosted by me. Uh, both Justice and Akeem A. Rich from Built in Buffalo here have been guests on it and will be again in the future. Um, that is all about the NFL. Uh, episode three, David versus Goliath with A. Rich was an amazing, amazing uh, episode. Uh, and then episode four, which just dropped, which is called Exposed or is titled Exposed, um, also just dropped recently as well. So go ahead, watch those. Um, but again, not done yet. Season three premiere, part one of the rivalry, which is all about hockey, um, dropped as well. And if you like wrestling, Dead Horses and DDTs, episode seven uh, just dropped as well. That is, however, a bi-weekly podcast. So you're only going to get it about twice a month. So that's so much has dropped. Go listen to it. Go consume the content. It's so different from what we're doing at Built in Buffalo. However, it's one and the same. I just needed to get those two things out of the way before we get into uh, what we're talking about here today. So as you can see, I'm all, I'm all sabers out. Um, draft hat from this year. I had to let it grow on me a little bit. I have my 90s night pennant. And I have some of the banners above. Oh man, I can't even get that straight. I have some of the banners above for the Sabres. That's every year, every banner that they've gotten since I was born. So I was born in 98, so it starts in 99, 2000, uh, and then uh, 2010, 2011. Um, so there's a reason for this. Obviously, yes, it's huge news that the Buffalo Bills just beat the Chiefs, but we talked so much about the Chiefs, especially in the Rust Belt episode the Rust Belt Report episode with A. Rich Akeem, where we talked about the Chiefs. I even talked about the Chiefs uh, last week on the Ryan C. Show with Justice as well. Um, so we're going to talk about that here, but let's talk about the Sabres. Let's get into this. Um, the, man, the Sabres might not be as bad as we all thought that they were going to be. Last season, everybody said, hey, this is potentially a playoff contending team. Uh, we were bottom of the basement. Um, you know, we were in the basement for the league. In fact, we were one win out of being in the extended playoff spot. However, our loss to Montreal was Montreal's gain as that win against us launched them into uh, the playoffs last year. And so everybody thought, well, you know, they weren't going to make it in the first place. But is Montreal that good of a team? They're going to get swept in the first round. They did not. They fought their way to the Stanley Cup Finals where they did get swept, but they fought their way to the finals. They were a finalist team. 
We played them, and we being the Buffalo Sabres, played them in the home opener, and we beat the brakes off of them. All right. Uh, this is a five and one score. Uh, so that puts Montreal. Uh, I do want to say that Montreal has played already. So I don't know exactly what their record is, but this puts the Sabres. The Sabres are undefeated. We're actually first place in the Atlantic. And I get it. There's 81 more games to go, which means 81 more W's. Um, unfortunately, not that realistic. But the Sabres absolutely beat up on Montreal and I was able to actually be at the game. They were birthday present uh, from my family. I was, I went with my grandfather. We were there. We actually saw the entire game. Um, and, and so let, let's dig into some analysis from the game. Uh, first off, I have to say, you guys, if you know me, you know, I'm not a big Jack Eichel person. All right. Um, Jack Eichel, I think is more useful to this team now is a trade asset, even a diminished trade asset. Um, than he is as a player. And that was shown last night. You beat a Stanley Cup final team and people are still saying, well, Montreal's not that good. Montreal's not that good. They were in the finals. They're, they're a good team. You can say it. Um, even without Price, even without the fact that Kakinyemi was um, offer sheeted by Carolina and went to Carolina, um, even by the fact that they do not have Carey, I, I believe I just mentioned Carey Price, but they don't have Carey Price. Kakinyemi is gone. Um, and Shea Weber is on LTIR long-term injured reserve as well due to injuries that he had sustained during the playoff, the Montreal playoff run, uh, to be specific, uh, last season. But even without that, they're really young. Cole Caulfield, which is a top-tier goal scorer for them, um, and, and as a young process, prospect, same class as our very own Dylan Cousins, um, this, this is not a team to mess with. We went out there and immediately in the first period, we put the pressure on them. You could tell that these guys were having fun first and foremost. They were out there playing hockey. The first two goals came in the first period. They were both scored by the assistant captains uh, this season in Kyle Pozo, followed by uh, Zemgis Gergensen. Um, I mean, Akposa looks the best that he's ever looked. Gergensen looks the best that he's ever looked. I'm not going to complain about it, um, but I'm not yet going to fill out an apology form for either one of those guys. They have to keep it up, uh, that pace of play throughout 81 games of the season and potentially the playoffs. Following up with that, Tage Thompson ended up with a goal as well, which is great. Um, I'm, just, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head who had goals last night. I believe Dylan Cousins had a goal last night. Um, Regardless of who scored, the team looked good. They looked like they were having fun. It looked like they were um, uh, they, they were free to play. When you had Kruger, it was a very discipline-oriented uh, system, whereas now they're free to play how they want to play, and that's something that we've seen work in any sports organization. Um, we saw how it was detrimental to the Buffalo Bills for so many years. We see... Um, though some success in what um, the New England Patriots were able to achieve, but also that left players unhappy taking hometown discounts and not getting paid what, they, what their talent level was on the field. Um, going into the second period, the boys looked like they kind of let up a little bit, but once, once Montreal scored their, that one goal, uh, it was back on. It was, it was back on. Um, well, that occurred in the first, so they kind of slowed up around the first, but it was back on in the second um, after still slowing it, uh, down a little bit once they realized that Montreal was putting, you know, kind of their foot to the gas as well. Um, Craig Anderson was was really integral in stopping some, some really big shots. Uh, however, the one glaring mistake for the entire night for both the defense and goaltending was the textbook goal um, that Montreal set up in the first period. Um, it was a textbook setup. You could see it coming from miles away. Um, let's talk about refereeing because the play calling in this from the, like, and by play calling, I mean the referees, what they were and were not calling. I mean, there were blatant, blatant hooking and tripping happening to Sabres players in the Sabres zone during what I want to say was the third period. Um, that wasn't called, and thankfully it wasn't called um, because we ended up scoring a goal like 15 seconds later, right off of that. Um, but this is this is a, a again a Stanley Cup final team that we went in there and manhandled. 
Um, we're obviously playing weaker teams coming up here in the first little bit of the season. Uh, Arizona being today as you're watching this episode on Saturday. Um, but we are also playing harder teams, teams that we did not play last year because of the divisional realignment um, for the NHL. Another big thing that uh, was really easy to notice was that these guys were, uh, by these guys, I mean the Sabres, they were passing a lot more. The pace of play was not faster than what they could handle. Um, it was not dictated by one player who can skate faster than everybody else. And also they were, like I said, they were passing the puck a lot more. And it's, it's important that I bring that up because Jack Eichel was and is a puck hog. He will take the puck from one zone to the other, which is great, but he won't be able to score because it's just him against four to five other players because everybody else is behind him. All right. Um, that doesn't make him a bad player, but it doesn't make him a team player. It doesn't make him the leader that he is supposed to be. Um, so I am, for one, happy that he's on his way out the door here relatively soon. And you say that, you hear me say that, and you say, Ryan, what are you talking about? Well, it's ESPN's first week back on the NHL beat. And I do have to say really quick, they've done an immaculate job. The game presentation is awesome. We can get into that here in a little bit. But um, Eichel, uh, in their first week on the job, um, they just released a bombshell of a report on, on I want to say, Thursday um, that Jack Eichel was part of an imminent trade. Uh, what the Sabres believed was an imminent trade. And part of this imminent trade had um, Jack Eichel going to an undisclosed team uh, for what was going to be a, a good trade between both uh, franchises involved. Again, it was not disclosed, but it was believed to be imminent. However, the team that this was to fell silent on Friday. The team has not heard from them since. Now, again, I'm recording this on Friday. You're watching this on Saturday. So if it changes in any time in between, I apologize that you're getting this late. Um, obviously, I cannot anticipate it. Um, but I wish that I could. The uh, That said, um, any of the five teams that are rumored to be involved in uh, trade talks with the Buffalo Sabres, specifically about Jack Eichel, all five would allow him to have his surgery. All five would also require uh, conditions on the picks uh, or any picks involved um, with the Sabres as well. And that is all, of course, something that we've reported on before here at the Ryan C Show. I believe I did that episode with Justice. So you can go back and listen to that conversation or watch, listen and watch that conversation. Um, because we talked about some of the conditions uh, that were coming out on some of those picks. But yes, Jack Eichel was apparently supposed to be traded on Thursday. So before the season even kicked off uh, just a few hours before, or sorry, a week before. So not this past Thursday, um, the Thursday before. So the report came out this past Thursday, the Thursday before is when this was supposed to happen. So about a week before the season kicked off, Jack Eichel was going to be traded. That said, we're going to get into the bills here really quick. Um, and we're going to weave in and out of the hockey and football talks. The way I keep your guys' attention. I know that the Sabres are not that exciting to talk about right now, but it was an exciting game. It's going to be a good year no matter what. Um, and a lot of young guys are going to have opportunities to come up and kind of, you know, uh, strut their stuff. But the Bills did beat the Chiefs. And this is this is really big because, of course, the Chiefs were the team to beat in the AFC as they were the AFC champions. Obviously, Buffalo losing to them by a score of two uh, in last year's AFC championship game. We all know the uh, picture of uh, Stefan Diggs watching the confetti fall watching the chiefs celebrate as well um the bills beat the chiefs by simply doing what they set out to do after the afc championship game they put pressure on the quarterback greg russo aj epinesa uh boogie basham they were able to go and put pressure on the quarterback forcing mahomes into uncomfortable situations things he did not expect from the buffalo bills now that's not without saying that we had some help from within the chiefs themselves we have the number one defense. We have one of the uh, top offenses in the NFL. And of course, Patrick Mahomes and their offense, it's deep, it's versatile, it's dynamic, but their offense or their defense stinks. I'm telling you, their defense stinks. They're currently one of the worst in the league, if not the worst in the league. Um, and their backfield is just uh, atrocious, tremendously atrocious uh, for 
wow, I cannot speak today. It is tremendously just trash in the backfield. Let's say that. Um, and so it was easy for us to kind of beat up them on an odd beat up on their defense from an offensive point of view, but our, our defense looked like it had was seasoned. Um, it's filled with a lot of rookies. It's filled with uh, veterans that were just coming off of injuries, just like Jordan Poyer, who was out the week before Matt Milano didn't even play AJ Klein came in and took his place. AJ Klein did not miss a beat. This is a team that if you see them in the playoffs, you're going to beat them. That said, that said, I don't think you're going to see the chiefs, the Kansas city chiefs in the playoffs this year. Now, listen, might be a hot take. But I think that's definitely a hot take, right? I mean, that's a team that two years ago won a Super Bowl. They ran it back last year, losing to Tampa Bay, but still making it, beating the Buffalo Bills, um, who were on an unprecedented run uh, since the 90s. I don't think Kansas City makes the playoffs this year, and I'll tell you why. Even though I think the Ravens were exposed by the Indianapolis Colts this past week, I think that Baltimore – makes the playoffs, right? So that's one AFC team. You then have the LA Chargers who have not been an AFC contention or playoff contention team before. Buffalo will be returning. If, if Indianapolis can figure out their quarterback situation and consistency of quarterback, you may be talking about seeing Indianapolis um, in there. If, the, if uh, not the Cowboys, but if Cleveland picks it up a little bit as well, you may be talking about seeing Cleveland um, even in the playoff discussion again. I think Pittsburgh does fall out. But that being said, I think Kansas City, you just got, I mean, you almost lost. So first off, you have all these AFC teams that were non-competitors before, right? Uh, follow that up with the fact that you almost lost to the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, who currently still suck. Um, you almost lost to the Philadelphia Eagles. You then come in and you get manhandled by the Buffalo Bills. Um, when that happens, I don't see you getting into the playoffs at all because you just I mean, you almost lost to Philadelphia, which means you almost lost to crappy teams, and you're definitely um, losing to really good teams. And they have some really good teams that are playing uh, that are on their schedule for the remainder of the season. They play the Saints two more times. Um, I got to bring this back up, but they do play the Saints two more times this season. The Saints have been very good so far uh, in this season. Washington football team, I would not count them out just yet. Um, let's see. It looks like they are playing the Titans, uh, the Giants, Packers, Raiders, the Cowboys, Broncos, uh, Raiders again, the Chargers, Bengals, Broncos. And I mean, hey, the Bengals almost just beat Green Bay. So they have some tough teams. Uh, Washington is two and three, same record as Kansas City. I think they're going to start to figure it out, especially after watching what Buffalo just did. Who They had just lost to Buffalo. Watching what Buffalo just did against Kansas City as well. I think you're potentially looking at a, a two and four Chiefs team after Washington. Again, looking at a two and five Chiefs team after the Titans. Uh, definitely looking at probably three and six against the Packers. You're probably losing to the Raiders and the Cowboys and the Chargers and potentially the Bengals as well. So I, I don't think that it's a good season at all ahead for Kansas City. But hey, what do I know? Um, we will have to wait and see to find out. But I, I just legitimately don't think that it's in the cards for Kansas City this year. The reason being they bought a Super Bowl. They attempted to buy a second one. They now don't have the money to buy even playoff games. Whereas teams like Buffalo and Indianapolis and the Chargers, specifically Buffalo and Chargers, have built up a team over time with guys that the league has cast aside as saying they're not going to be good ever. Um, there's nothing good about them. Um, and also, uh, but these teams realizing, hey, these are really good, talented players um, like Herbert and Allen. Uh, and some of the guys that they've brought in off of free agency as well. So moving on from that, we are moving into uh, the Buccaneers. So we were just talking about the Buccaneers. Why are we talking about them now? Um, well, I think that they're going to become an easier target uh, for the Bills. Um, I do believe that we played them this season and let us look that up here really quick. Um, 
but even if not, they're potentially a team that you're looking at as being in the playoffs. And let me see right here. Yes, we play the Buccaneers on December 12th I just, uh, at 4 25. So not a primetime game, but later on a Sunday. Um, we play them December 12th at 425. But you're definitely seeing them in the NFC. Uh, at some point, they are the team to be there. Can the Packers do it? Well, they haven't been able to do it the last two years. They had a shaky start to the beginning of of the season. But again, speaking on weak defenses, the Bucks defense has a mountain of injuries that's only getting deeper and deeper every week. And it seems to be specifically centered around their veterans. So are they going to become an easier target? I want to say yes. Um, not even that, but um, Rob Gronkowski on the offensive side of the ball also out for a number of weeks with multiple injuries. Um, so it looks like the Bucks are being subtracted from the equation due to the subtraction of players. So they are um, dealing with so many injuries. Uh, so it's making them an easier target. Whether they're all back and those injuries stop by the time you hit December is a different story. We are only in the middle of October. You can see by the calendar behind me and on the dates on your phone as you're watching this. But even though it's a far, far time away, that's also games that they're playing um, in between. Um, and so as a Super Bowl winning team, they're also playing a lot of primetime games. So they're going to be um, not recuperating and rehabbing as much in between games because of the consistency that they're playing. Now, again, they're also playing really good teams this season as well. So they're going to be hit harder. Uh, these guys are going to have to work a whole heck of a lot more. I think you're potentially looking at an easier target for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when we see them in December, um, potentially when you see them in the playoffs, that being in the Super Bowl. Um, we're going to hop back into hockey really quick before we finish up here with football. I do want to stop and say, though, two things, of course, earlier uh, talking about LDG Sports and Entertainment. Go ahead, and if you could give us a follow on Twitter. Uh, we're not going to inundate your news feed with news, the same news that you're getting from Schefter and Rappaport and Built in Buffalo and Buffalo Fanatics and uh, I mean, how many else, uh, how many others are, are the charging Buffalo, like we're not going to inundate your news feed with, with news. Uh, we're just going to let you know when our episodes go up. We're going to be nice and respectful in that way. We're going to let you know when the episodes go up. We will be retweeting news from our official partner, Built in Buffalo, which, of course, you're watching right here. So um, also go ahead. You can follow um, LDG Sports and Entertainment on Twitter at the LDGSE. Again, that's at the LDGSE. Or just look on anchor.fm backslash LDGSE. Um, Go ahead and also follow and pay attention to everything built in Buffalo, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. We are everywhere. Uh, we like interacting with you guys. We like when you guys follow and share the content. Uh, we're going to recognize that. We're not just here to make content and forget about you guys, the fans. When we think about the team um, that's being built and cultivated here at Built in Buffalo, the fans are also the number one member of that team. The first question is always, how are the fans going to react to this? How are they going to be part of this? How are we going to make it interactive, make it feel like they're part of the team, part of the family? Um, it's legitimately a, gr a great place to be making content with. So thank you all for watching this and the other shows, both live, recorded, audio, video, whatever it is. Thank you so much. So let's go into hockey here really quick. And I apologize if you're going to hear the rain. I, I'm recording this during the rainstorm. Um, but we have some news uh, on the Sabres front again um, to discuss here. So Casey Middlestat and Henry Yoki Haru, who made their season, their 2021-2022 seasonal debuts against the Montreal Canadiens. Um, are both out and injured for multiple weeks. Uh, Casey Millsat with an upper body injury, Yogi Haru with a lower body injury. Um, they're going to be out for a couple of weeks, but have no fear. Their backups are no joke. Will Butcher, who we acquired um, in this off season through free agency. Previously, we were in contention to get Will Butcher, uh, who chose to go to the New Jersey Devils, who he last played for. He is going to be replacing... 
Yoki Haru on defense. He's a really good defenseman. Um, he's just going to slot up uh, a little bit, uh, or he's going to slot into that uh, position. And Rustalainen, not Rustalainen, but R2 Rustalainen, otherwise known as R2D2, um, is going to be taking uh, Casey Middlesex's place at center as everybody else slots up one. So that's it. That's all we need to cover for the Sabres. We're going to get back into this last topic. Um, is Dawson Knox a top end elite NFL tight end? See a top tier NFL tight end, especially because we were just talking, or especially because of you know the Zach Ertz trade now in uh, from Eric from Philadelphia to Arizona. Greg Kittle is out. Is 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 Dawson Knox a top tier uh, or at least a an elite tight end in the NFL? And I gotta I gotta say really quick before I go into my argument. I want to hear your guys' thoughts below. So go start typing out your argument. And then below that, let me know why I'm either right or wrong. Just hear me out on this, all right? I say yes. I think he is an elite tight end in the NFL. Now wait, before you hit it, before you hit post, let me explain. There are 32 jobs for basically everything in the NFL, almost everything, right? Um, there's only 32 wide receiver one positions. There's only 32 starting quarterbacks. There are only 32 head coaches, 32 GMs, 32 kickers, 32 punters. 32 RB1s. 32 centers. 32, 32, 32. There are not 32 TE1 positions, true TE1 positions in the NFL. And now you might be asking yourself, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Every team has a tight end. Yeah, you're correct. Every team does have a tight end. But not every team has a true TE1 position. There is a lack of talent at tight end one in the National Football League. Either players don't develop to what we think that they're going to be, or they're just not there evidenced by the fact that Tim Tebow tried to make an NFL comeback as a tight end in Jacksonville this year, although that might have been the best thing that happened to Jacksonville so far this season. There are only a few elite, top quality tight end ones in the NFL, and I just named some of them. Zach Ertz, uh, Philadelphia, now in Arizona, who replaced their tight end one, who I believe was Max Williams. Never heard of him. Um, Zach Ertz, Travis Kelsey, Greg Kittle, some might say even Darren Waller, Mark Andrews in Baltimore, certainly a tight end one. I can't really tell you any other tight ends in the league. Cannot. Well, you know, David Njoku and, and Austin Hooper, but they're not really true tight end ones, right? Njoku never really developed, and Austin Hooper was brought in from Atlanta. I guess you could say Kyle Pitts, but it's really too early to see if he's a true TE1. Dawson Knox's development from last season, from the seasons previous to now, has been immaculate. It has been elite level. I mean, it is Josh Allen going into last year um, type development. He is way more consistent with his catches. His route running is better. Um, his coverage has sometimes doubled in games so far this season because he is making the catches that he did not make before. He is a true TE one. And because the talent at tight end is so few and far between, truly throughout the entire league, this consistency, this rapid jump in development is why Dawson Knox is an elite tight end in the NFL. He just needs to keep it up. Um, I'm going to end there. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of the Ryan C Show. Go ahead, click the subscribe button, like, comment, leave your comments and your thoughts. I'm going to read them. We might be doing something special here soon. We just got to talk about it. Um, you might be getting some special editions, live editions of the Ryan C Show as well with fan engagement. 
Um, I want to thank you guys so much. Again, you can follow me on Twitter at Ryan C show underscore B I B. I will follow you back. I will interact with you. Thank you guys so much. I will see you next week.